doing uh, this message and for the watch parties that all of you are, are doing. It encourages me as I spend um, each day uh, studying and preparing and it's just so awesome to know that that you guys are studying right along with me. You're like uh, you're like the Bereans and, and you're searching out the scriptures uh, daily. So I want to thank you for that. Before we get into uh, 2 Timothy, today is the National Day of Prayer. And we had an awesome opportunity gathering together with some pastors for the National Day of Prayer. I am on New Mexico board, or New Mexico Praise Board, and we, we gather together. We've been praying for our state for three years, 24-7. And it's an awesome ministry. Our churches are involved in that. And we really just believe that our state is where it is today because of the power of prayer. And so I want to encourage you to continue to pray for our state, pray for our nation, pray for our president, our vice president, all of our leaders, all of those who are making decisions. Our nation needs prayer. And we also need to pray for a spiritual awakening Within our nation, we need to pray that our, our churches uh, would be revived and that God would pour out His Spirit among us in these days in which we are living. And so before we get into 2 Timothy, let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Let's pray for our nation. Father, we thank you, Father God, for this nation that we live in. Lord God, we thank you for the freedom. We thank you for the democracy that we have. We thank you for the freedom of religion and Lord God, the freedom to do uh, what we're doing tonight, preaching the word of God. Lord, I pray for our president and our vice president and all of his leaders. Your word says, Lord God, to pray for those who are in authority and we pray for them. We pray God that you would give them wisdom we pray that you would give them understanding from heaven. We pray, Lord God, that those who are around them would pray for them and that they would seek counsel from godly men and godly women who will speak into their lives. We pray, Lord God, that our nation would be led by righteousness and not by wickedness, Lord God. So we pray that God, you would do a mighty and a holy work. We pray that God, people would repent in leadership. People would come to faith in Christ and that God, they would turn from their sins and they would turn to Almighty God. So we pray, Father God, not only for our leaders, but we also pray God for a spiritual awakening within our nation. Lord, our nation has given themselves over to idolatry over to sin, Lord God, over to, over to lewdness and, and uh, killing babies. Lord, we pray, God, that you, Lord God, would awaken the people in our nation. And Lord, for us as a church, I pray that you would revive the church, Lord. God, it, it begins in the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. And so it starts with us. And if we want to impact, Lord God, our country, we have to be men and women who are living out righteousness. We have to be the church that's on the move and doing what you've called us to do, being the salt and the light of the earth. So, Lord God, forgive us as a church. Forgive us for the sins that we've added to the nation. Forgive us, Lord God, for, for doing what, what we're not supposed to be doing. Lord God, I pray for revival to take place within the church. Lord, your word says that if your people call out to you, that you will answer. Lord God, if we humble ourselves and if we turn from our wicked ways, you will heal, hear from heaven and you will heal our land. So Lord God, we pray that you would hear from heaven and that you would heal our land and that God, you would do, Lord God, something miraculous within our country. I pray for all those that are sick, Lord God, from the coronavirus and other diseases. God, I pray that you would touch their lives, that you would heal them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint them and minister to them where they're at at this very moment. For those who are in the hospitals, Lord God, touch their bodies, Lord God, revive them, bring them out. 
Be with their families and comfort them, Lord God. Be gracious and merciful. Surround them with loving kindness and tender mercy. Lord God, we pray that, God, you would, Lord God, stop this disease in its tracks. Lord God, but we also pray, Lord God, that we, Lord God, would be a people that not only seek your face, but turn, Lord God, from our own ways and turn to your ways, Lord God. And we pray that you would give us the patience and the endurance, Lord God, and and that you would work all things together for the good. So we pray for this nation. We love this nation. We thank you that we get to be a part of a great country. We pray, Father, for righteousness and revival to prevail within our land Give us one more opportunity, Lord God, to do what you've called us to do in this time that we are now living in. And so, Lord, we bless you. We ask you now to open our hearts, open our minds to your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Last night, we looked at the characteristics of of humanity and what it's going to be like in the last days before Jesus' return. And from the scriptures that we looked at, we know that it's going to be very perilous, as Paul told Timothy. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. The last days begin with the ministry of Jesus Christ and will continue until His return. So in the last days... There will be um, times of adversity, savage, difficult, dangerous days. And we looked at 18 different characteristics. I'm not going to go through all of them, but some of them are men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, very selfish, self-centered, self-focused in the last days all humanity will be able to think about is themselves and no one else. Be very selfish, loving self, loving money, uh, boasters, braggers, uh, prideful, disobedient to parent, disobedient to to parents, and thankful, unholy, un, unloving, brutal, traitors, headstrong, haughty having a form of godliness, having a form of religion, but denying the power there within. So it's going to be very, very perilous in the last days. As I closed out my message, I ended with these words. The times are not going to get better, but we can become better even in bad times. So the question How can we become better in bad times? My answer, the scriptures. The scriptures, also known as the Bible, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the bread of life, the book. We can become better in bad times through the scriptures, God's word, the Bible is a living book. It's a powerful book. It has changed more lives in human history than in any other book. It, it's a book that, as someone once said, it has feet, it'll run after you. It has hands, it'll grab a hold of you. It's alive, it's active, it's not a dead book. It's transformed my life. It changed me from a, a sinner who was on the path of destruction to a saint who's now on the path to heaven. And if it could change me, it could change you. The book is powerful. The Bible is powerful. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. The word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose and the lion will defend itself. God's word is powerful. So if we want to become better in bad times, we need to live out the scripture. We need to apply the scriptures to our lives. So I want to look at three things tonight that will help us to push through hard things. We need to, first of all, carefully follow God's word. Number two, we need to continue in it. And then finally, we need to apply it. 
So we need to carefully follow it. We need to continue in it and we need to apply it to our lives. So let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10 through verse 17. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So we talked about that last night. In the last days, it's going to get even more, it's going to get worse. It's going to become really, really bad. And we see that there's going to be persecution that's ramped up against Christians. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse. Uh, deceiving, they're going to deceive people and they are also going to be deceived by the deceiver. Verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise through faith, wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So back to verse 10, Paul is speaking to Timothy, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. Timothy was a pastor, as I mentioned, in Ephesus. Paul had raised him up. Paul uh, taught him. Taught, Paul gave him uh, instruction on, on how to live a godly life, how to be a man of, of God. He discipled him. He molded him and he shaped him. And, and he just poured his heart. He poured his life into Timothy. And I love what he reminds him of. He said, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. So we know that Timothy carefully followed the doctrine that Paul taught and the doctrine that he preached. If you and I follow something carefully, we follow it wisely. Carefully also means to, to uh, be watchful or wise or thorough. So if we follow something carefully, we follow it wisely, thoroughly, or watchfully. So Timothy followed God's word, the doctrine, carefully. It was something that, that he followed with all of his heart. Notice the word doctrine, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. The word doctrine means teaching, instruction, or that which is taught. So it means instruction, teaching, or that which is taught. That's what doctrine means. Don't, don't uh, um, be afraid of that word. It's, it just basically simply means teaching, instruction, or that which is taught. And one thing we know about the early church in the first century is that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What doctrine were the apostles teaching? Well, they were teaching the Bible. They were teaching God's Word. That is what they were teaching. Like Paul said to Timothy, preach the Word. That's all you have. Preach the Word. And that's what they were teaching. The doctrine that they were teaching was the Word of God, the Bible. They weren't teaching the doctrine of philosophy. They weren't teaching the doctrine of, of psycho psychology. They weren't teaching uh, the doctrine of, of the common wisdom of the day. But they were teaching, instructing men and women from the book. That's what they were using, the Old Testament. They were teaching them 
the Bible. And so, and the early church, they continued steadfastly in that. It's so important that we, we stay the course and that we carefully follow the teaching of Jesus Christ. And if we follow the teaching of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, if you and I carefully follow God's Word, these 66 books, 66 books, Genesis, all the, all the way to Revelation, 40 different authors inspired by the Holy Spirit, written on several different continents, uh, all pointing from Genesis to Revelation to Jesus Christ. The Word of God, it's powerful, it's without error, it's infallible, it's inerrant, it is the authority on which we stand. It's the final authority. And they weren't teaching their opinions or their philosophies. Speaking of the early church, speaking of Paul the Apostle, but they were teaching the doctrine of God's Word. There's a lot of doctrines out there today. And it's so important that we indoctrinate ourselves with God's Word. It's so important that we study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's so important that we be like Bereans. The Bereans were in, in the New Testament and they, they, they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true, to make sure that it aligned up with what Paul was saying. Scripture, my friend, interprets scripture. So that's the best way to interpret scripture. The Old Testament interprets the New Testament and the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. So Scripture interprets Scripture. And when you allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, you're going to be okay. A lot of times, uh, false teachers, what they will do is they will take a text and they will take that text out of context. Like, for example, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They'll take that text, but they don't give you the context. They don't give you the before, and they don't give you the after. And so if you were to read the verses before John 3, 16, you would read that Nicodemus, who was a rabbi, uh, excuse me, Nicodemus, who was a religious man, he came to, to Jesus at night and he wanted to know about the signs and, and the miracles and the wonders that Jesus was doing. And Jesus then told him, he went on to say, Nicodemus, because Nicodemus, how can a, how can a man be born again? And, and Jesus told him, and you see, Nicodemus thought that uh, it was he was talking about physical birth, but Jesus was talking about spiritual birth. He said, "If you want to be born again, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born from from above. That's the only way that you can receive eternal life." So he's talking to Nicodemus before, and then afterwards, after John three sixteen, it says, "For God so loved the world that He gave." His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And then he talked about how men love darkness rather than light, and, and they don't come to the light because their evil deeds are exposed. So, so you have the, the, the context, the before and the after. So it's important that we read the context, we find out what was said before and what was said after. So we have a good understanding, a good context of what God's Word is saying. So we want to study to show ourselves approved. We want to carefully follow the teaching of Jesus. And as we do, as we carefully follow the teaching of God's Word, it will give us direction for our lives. We will know what our purpose is. Our faith will grow and we'll learn how to suffer long and our love for God will grow deeper and our love for one another will grow deeper. As it says in verse 10, you've carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, long suffering, love and perseverance. Who was Paul following? Well, he was fo he followed God's word. And so as he followed God's word, then that's what he was teaching. He was teaching man uh, the doctrine of God's word. 
And so Timothy, as he was following the doctrine of God's word, then God was giving him direction for his life. God gave him purpose. God, God uh, strengthened his faith. God taught him how to suffer long and, and how to love others and how to persevere. And God even gave him strength in verse 11 as, as Timothy too went through persecutions and afflictions, just like Paul went through persecutions and afflictions. So when we follow God's word, God's going to direct us. He's going to give us guidance. He's going to show us what his purpose is for our lives. Our faith will grow. Our love will grow. And we'll be, we'll become stronger. Our faith will be built up in God's word. So it's so important that we carefully follow the word of God. The Bible will also give us perseverance and the strength that we need as we go through persecutions and as we go through afflictions. And that's what Paul the apostle relied on. He always went back to the word of God. He always relied upon the word of God. And in 2 Timothy, that's what he's teaching. He's, he's teaching Timothy and the church the importance of, of relying on the Word of God, depending on the Word of God, standing upon the rock of Jesus Christ and, and applying it to our lives. Notice what he says in verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So evil men and deceivers will, will rise up. And a beautiful thing about knowing the truth and, and following carefully after God's word is that when a counterfeit looms on the horizon or when someone comes along and and they start talking about God's word, but then they throw some heresy in or some error. You'll know it. Why? Because you're a student. You're studying to show yourself approved. You're rightly dividing the word of truth. And, and you're, you're checking to make sure that what that person is teaching or preaching is accurate. And that it's not their opinions, their philosophy, but that it is coming from the word of God. And man, in hard times and, and pushing through hard times, we need the Word of God and we need to be able to discern because uh, evil men, imposters and deceivers are, are rising up and they're, they're going to rise up in a greater intensity as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And so we need to know the truth because the truth teaches us how to discern, which means to distinguish between truth and error, righteousness and unrighteousness. The Word of God enlightens our, our spiritual understanding and it gives us eyes to see clearly. We will know them by their fruit. And so if a false prophet comes along, you will know your spiritual antennas will go up and you'll be like, not, not true. That's not right. We're are you finding that in the Bible? Where does God speak about that? You'll know because your discernment, your spiritual antennas will go up. The alert that's in your heart will go off. You'll know because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and, and the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to discern and you'll know that it's not truth because you have been studying the truth. It's kind of like bank tellers. What do they, what do they study? They don't study the, the, the counterfeit. They, they study the real money. They know how it feels. They know how it smells. They know what it looks like. So that when somebody tries slipping through a counterfeit $100 bill, they could feel it and they automatically know it. Because they know the, the truth of, of that $100 bill so well because they've studied it so much that they know when a, when a fake bill is trying to come through. In the same way, when we know the truth, when some evil imposter or some deceiver who is deceiving and being deceived 
rises up will know that that is error. That's unrighteousness. That's not true. And so the Bible gives us the ability to discern. So we need to exercise our senses, our discernment by studying the word of God. So we should carefully follow it. Carefully follow it. Secondly, we need to continue in it. Verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. So we need to continue in the word. We need to carefully follow it and we need to continue in it. The word continued means to persevere in, to keep moving ahead, forward motion. If you are continuing in a project or continuing in an endeavor, you are moving forward. You are persevering in that. And we need to persevere in. We need to keep moving forward, forward motion. We need to continue in the word until the day that we die. And we are to continue in it when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it, when it's politically correct and when it's not politically correct. We need to continue in it when we're on the mountain peak and things are going good in our lives and or, or when we're down and out in the dumps. We need to continue in the Word of God. So, forward motion. Keep moving forward. Continue in the Word of God. Don't stop. Uh, keep going forward. Forward motion. Continue in it. And as you do, it will give you assurance. As it says in verse 14, but you must continue in the thing, things which you have learned and been assured of. So, God's Word will give you that assurance. God's Word will give you confidence. So when we continue in something, we have assurance, we have confidence. And I love that God's Word gives us assurance. It gives us confidence. It, it, it strengthens our trust in the Lord. So let's continue in it. Let's not stop. Let's keep moving forward every single day. Read it when you feel like it. Read it when you don't feel like it. Read it in season. Read it out of season. Write God's word on the tablet of your heart. Uh, speak it. And God will give you good success. But you need to continue in God's word. It will give you assurance. And it will also uh, make you wise for salvation. Verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So another beautiful thing about the, God's, the Holy Scriptures is that the Scriptures are holy, pure, set apart. That's what the word holy means. It means hagios, set apart. The Scriptures are pure. And the Scriptures, they purify us. The Scriptures sanctify us. Us. In other words, they, they cleanse us. Uh, the scriptures are like, like soap, if you will. I know a lot of you have been washing your hands way more than you ever have in, in your past years because of the virus. So you're constantly washing your hands and, and that the molecule in the soap, it, it's effective. It, it kills, it destroys the virus. Uh, the virus can't stand against the soap. The soap destroys it. In the same way, the holy scriptures, which are holy, they sanctify our hearts. They, they cleanse our hearts. They renew our minds. They straighten us out and they purify us. And that's the beautiful thing about reading the scripture is, is that, that it, it cleanses, it sanctifies. We sometimes get dirty. The, the world dirties us, or you might have thoughts that aren't pure, that aren't clean. And, and you get into the scriptures and you're sanctified, you're cleansed, you're washed, you're, you're purified. That's why we need to be in the scriptures on a regular basis. We need to continue in them because we always need to be washed. 
sanctified. And in fact, the Bible talks about sanctification and our sanctification won't end until we are with the Lord in heaven. So we are constantly being sanctified, cleansed, set apart, washed, purified, dipped in the word, if you will. And so we need to stay continually in the holy scriptures, which make you wise for salvation. The scriptures make us wise for salvation. The scripture has the power to save. How do I know? Let me read this scripture in James 1 21. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So God's word has the power to save your soul. God, God's word has the power to make you wise for salvation. So here's what I know about studying God's word, and I still have a long way to go. Um, st I study every day, and, and sometimes the more I study, the, the more I realize, man, how much I don't know. You could never exhaust the scriptures. And the more you study, the more you realize how much you don't know. And, and it, it's just amazing. You can't exhaust it. It's deep beyond deep. We, we can't even comprehend the depth of God's word or, or the width of, of God's word or the height of, of God's word. It's absolutely amazing. And so we can't exhaust it. And, and that's why we need to constantly be in uh, the scriptures so that we can uh, have that confidence to share salvation. When I'm in God's word and, and I have it in me, it's building me up, it's strengthening me, it's encouraging me, it, it, all, it gives me the confidence to, to share salvation. It makes me wise for salvation to understand that I'm only saved through Jesus Christ. There's only one way into heaven, and that's through, through Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So a person can't get to heaven uh, through anyone else. A person can't make it into heaven on, on good works or through religion. A person can only get to heaven through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. So it makes you wise for salvation. And, and we come to that understanding that if we want to be saved, we're only saved through Jesus Christ. We can only get to God the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, but also makes you wise when it comes to sharing salvation. And so that's why it's so important to stay continually in the Word. It'll wise you up, if you will. It'll give you wisdom. It'll help you. It'll teach you how to share, how to evangelize um, others and, and how to you know bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And so it gives you assurance. It makes you wise. And I say these things not only because they're true, but because these are the things that God's word has done for me and continues to do for me. So carefully follow God's word. Continue in God's word. And finally, we need to apply God's word to our lives. Notice verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Back in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then it gives us a list on what it's profitable for. So what do we know about scripture? We know that it's inspired. It's God breathed. The Holy Spirit used men of God to write the word of God. Second Peter chapter 1, jot this down. Verses 20 through 22, knowing this first, that no prophecy uh, of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So what do we, what do we, what do we know? 
We know that Scripture is inspired, God breathed. We know that the Holy Spirit used men of God to write the Word of God. It, it, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. Forty different authors over a 1,500-year period wrote the Old Testament and the New Testament. The majority of them never even met, and they all pointed to Jesus Christ. So we know that it's inspired. It's, it's God-breathed. It's not the inspiration of man. It's the inspiration of God. It's God breathe. I like how the NLT puts it. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. And God uses the Holy Scriptures, the inspired Word of God, to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. So, it's not enough just to know God's Word, but we need to apply God's Word to our lives. In other words, we need to live it out. It needs to be something that we do. We, we apply it. We, we live it out. We don't want just to have knowledge. You can have a lot of knowledge and you can, you can probably run with the best of them and you can quote scripture and you can probably debate and, and use your apologetics and, and you can just spew out scriptures and, and you could have all this knowledge. Now, I'm not knocking knowledge, but you could have all this knowledge. But if you're not applying it, then it's not making a difference. And knowledge puffs up. What we need to do and what we should be doing is we should be applying God's word to our lives. Notice what it says back in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, if you want to turn there, verses 22 through 25. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. So we don't want to just hear it, but we also want to do it. Hearing is important. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need to hear God's word. Faith comes how? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. So hearing is important. But we don't want to just be hearers of the word because we can hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it. Your husband can talk to you all day and, and, and tell you, I need, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Or your wife can talk to you and ask you, can you do this? Can you do that project? And you can hear it all day long, but if you don't apply it, it's not going to happen. The project's not going to get done. In the same way, we don't want to just hear it, but we want to do it. We want to live it out. Don't just be a do, just don't be a hearer, but, but be a doer. Because if you're only hearing it, not doing it, you're deceiving yourself. And we need to live, live it out. I've been to uh, Israel a couple of times with my wife and I. We, we went in 2013 and, and then we went um, last year. Beautiful land. Very amazing. If you've never been, hopefully you can go with us when we plan the next one. But uh, beautiful. And um, the first year we went in 2013, I went out there on a, on a messed up ankle. I had just badly sprained my ankle, the worst kind of sprain that you possibly can get. And so I was in the land uh, with a boot, walking around with a boot on my ankle. My ankle was like a balloon the entire time. And, and uh, me and two other pastors 
we were baptizing people from from our churches and so uh we did a baptism in the sea of 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 galilee beautiful now the sea of galilee uh is teeming with life there's there's fish it's just absolutely beautiful and what makes this sea beautiful is that it has an inlet the the jordan river flows into it and then it has an outlet and so it it flows out and it continues to go uh, further down so it's beautiful teeming with life and so here i am we're baptizing i'm in the i'm in the sea of galilee and i had to take off my boot to go into the water and um and and I, all of a sudden i start feeling like like something on my on my feet and and i i'm I can't move around all that much because uh, I'm, I'm pretty much just standing on, on, my, on my left foot. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on my right foot because I had to take my boot off and it was kind of rocky. And, and all of a sudden, I started feeling activity around my, around my feet. And before I knew it, I had fish basically biting my, my feet. Here's what was happening. They were giving me a fish pedicure that's what was going on they were giving me a fish pedicure and i knew wow this sea is teeming with life and it was teeming with life because it had an inlet and had an outlet now on the other hand we went down to the dead sea and the dead sea has an inlet but it has no outlet and as a result there's no life that's what they call it the dead sea we as christians we need to be not just hearers, but we need to be doers. So we need to have an inlet and we also need to have an outlet. So we take in God's word. We don't want to just sit and feed and feed and feed and become, you know, like chubby sheep. We want to take in and we want to give out. We don't want to be like the Dead Sea that has an inlet and we just get all puffed up, but we don't, we never apply it. We, we don't give it back out. We want to be like the Sea of Galilee that's teeming with life. Bunch of fish in there, ready to give you a fish pedicure at any moment. There's, there's life happening because it has an inlet and it flows out. So when you're reading the Bible, God's word, like it said here in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's going to reproof you. Basically, uh, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. And um, the word reproof also means to be tested, proved, or convicted. So God's word will reprove you. It will test you. It will, it will convict you. And so let's say, for example, you said something rude to your, to your spouse or you snapped at her. And, and then later on that day, you were reading the Bible and you came across these words, 1 Corinthians 13, 5, where it says, Love does not behave rudely does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. So you just read that verse. Earlier, you were rude to your wife and you realized it. And then, and then you read these, this verse later on and it says, love does not behave rudely. At that moment, you're convicted, you're reproofed. At that moment, you can be like, maybe you're at work, you can text your wife or you could call her, or maybe she's in the other room. You can go to her and say, would you please forgive me? I behave rudely today. I'm sorry for, for snapping at you or acting the way that I did. Or you could be like, ah, it wasn't that big of a deal. No biggie, no big deal. She'll get over it. And, and you just go on. And you keep on reading the rest of the verses. And you don't apply it. The key is that we apply it. So now, now you've, you've gone, you went to your wife and you're like, please forgive me. You applied what you read. So guess what? Everything's good. The relationship is good. But if you continue to go on and you ignore the reproofs, you ignore the, the conviction and, and you just continue to maybe behave rudely or do you know, whatever you want when, how, whenever you feel like it and, and you continue to act out, and you don't apply God's word, then guess what's going to happen? The relationship is going to start deteriorating. It's going to start falling apart. In the same way, if, if you, 
somebody offended you or you offended them and or let's say they offended you and you're not forgiving them um, then that relationship there's going to be an issue between you and and that person we have to apply God's word it's profitable for reproof it's profitable for correction which means improvement of life or character I love that that original word profitable for Correction, which means improvement of life or character. God's word improves our spiritual life and it gives us greater character. Instruction for, for righteousness or it instructs us in righteousness at the end of verse 16. God's word teaches us how to live right. It instructs us in righteousness. It trains us. It educates us in righteousness. God's word teaches us how to live rightly and don't forget that God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work that the man of God may be complete which means mature thoroughly equipped for every good work so God's word is profitable but we have to apply it we can't just hear it we we might have just we might we just read through that and we're like wow that's good 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 but now we have to apply it. Now we have to live it out. How are we going to follow, carefully follow it? How are we going to continue in it? How are we going to, to apply these things to our lives? And God's word is powerful. So how can you and I become better in bad times? Living out the Bible, living it out, applying it to our lives. Someone said, you may be the only Bible some people read. So just a quick recap. We need to carefully follow God's word. We need to continue in God's word. And we need to apply God's word to our lives. So if we want to become better in bad times, then we need to carefully follow God's word. We need to continue in God's word and we need to apply God's word because you and I might be the only Bible that some people read. They may never pick up this book, but they're reading your life. They're watching you. They're not going to tell you that they're watching you. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me and, and tell me, oh, I was watching you. I was, I was watching your life, but I never knew they were watching my life. And so people are watching us all the time and if we say that we're Christians and if we're telling them that we believe in the book the Bible they're going to want to see it lived out in our lives and as they see it being lived out they start realizing whoa that book is real it is alive like he said it was how can I get my hands on one of those how can I become like you and then you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them so let's Carefully follow it. Let's continue in it and let's apply it to our lives. And as you and I do that, we will become better people even in bad times. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit empowers us to carefully follow the Word of God. I pray, Lord God, that that would become part of what we do. And as we carefully follow God's Word, you will, God, give us direction. You'll give us guidance. You'll strengthen our faith. You'll grow our faith. Lord, as, as we continue in it, Lord God, you will, you will do great things in our lives. And as we apply God's Word to our lives, to our relationships, You'll change us, Lord. You'll do something miraculous in and through our lives. And so uh, I just want to encourage you as Christians to, to do those three things and, and uh, join me again tomorrow for one more teaching. But finally, if you're watching this and, and you are in a, in a place where you once were walking with God and, 
and you were following God, you carefully followed His words, you were continuing in it, you were applying it, but then you you fell back and you started living your old way and doing your old things and falling back into sin and, and you find yourself tonight miserable. You find yourself empty and and full of shame and guilt. And, and you know what you need to do and that's repent and come back to your first love. I want to lead you in a word of prayer if that's you or if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time. I want to give you that opportunity to confess and, and invite Jesus Christ to come and live inside of your heart. This book has the power to save your soul. It has the power to change you, to transform you. God's Word will give you a new heart. It'll give you a new mind. It will change you from the inside out. You'll still have problems and troubles, but guess what? You'll have Jesus helping you through your problems and through your troubles. And God will never leave you and God will never forsake you. So if you want to receive Jesus Christ, uh, say this prayer. Repeat this prayer after me. Don't say it to me, but say it to the Lord. Let's go. Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord God, to forgive me for my sins. I confess, Lord God, that I have sinned and that I have fallen short of your glory. Lord, I believe that you died and rose again. And so, Lord God, I, I give my life back to you. Lord God, I, I confess that you are my Lord and Savior. So, Lord God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I believe that you died and rose again. Give me the, the power to follow you, to be, become your follower the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. If you said that prayer, let us know. We'd love to send you a Bible. And again, thank you for joining us. We love you. I'll see you tomorrow night, our final night. So pre-read 2 Timothy chapter 4. Have a good night.